Is the recording working all right? Cool. All right. So. Hello. Hi. Haven, shush. <laughs> right. Um, hi. Uh, my name's Ben O'Rice. Uh, I work for Isilon. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about, um, well, this is kind of a, it's a story about um, about how we maintain our sort of internal fork of FreeBSD and the, uh, the, the joys and wonders involved. Um, so, yeah, so I work at Isilon, or rather EMC, Isilon. Um, Isilon's product, for those of you who don't really, um, who haven't come across it before, it's, um, it's clustered, scale out, network attached storage. So working that backward, it's storage. So it's, you put your data on it, you put your files on it. Um, it's network attached. So instead of most of the protocols being block based over something like SCSI, uh, the, product, the, the protocols are file based over the network. We do support iSCSI and stuff like that. But most of the use cases we use, we have HDFS, we have NFS, we have Samba, that kind of stuff. Um, it's scale out rather than scale up, which means that in, we, instead of taking out smaller things and putting in bigger things, we instead get you to add more things. Um, and it's clustered, so all our things get, stuck, get connected together by a back-end fabric and they all work together. Um, the things themselves, we call them nodes, uh, there's not a whole lot that's special about them. They're fairly off-the-shelf uh, x86-64 kit. Um, we do a lot of internal qualification on them. We do, um, there's a few custom bits, but not a whole lot. Um, the software, however, is a lot more interesting. Uh, the software we have is called OneFS. Um, it's a modified version of FreeBSD, which is why we're here. Um, it's a fairly significant modification of FreeBSD. Um, we do a lot of changes from just tuning parameters, we tweak some of the kernel logging stuff, we have a larger kernel stack, you know, the smaller things up to the larger things. We get right into the file system IO path, uh, CAM, GOM, buff, BIO. Um, we have a bunch of hacks for running a 32-bit user land on a 64-bit kernel. Um, we don't actually need them anymore, but they're still there. Um, we have large changes to the kernel NFS server. We have changes to credentials, we have changes to vnodeops, we have changes to all sorts of things. And then, as well as that, we have our on-disk file system code, our cluster backend networking, our internal user land stuff. These aren't um, as tied in to the rest of it. They're not so much diffs against FreeBSD, but they rely on the changes that we've made in other places. So the short version is, we have a fork. Um, so why do you fork? Well, in our case, it's fairly obvious. We have a whole bunch of, of constraints and use cases that don't apply to most uses of FreeBSD. I mean, the, the fact that our file system is actually distributed across multiple machines in a cluster is something that doesn't normally happen with FreeBSD. Um, that when, with, other, with other projects, I would actually if you can manage it, I wouldn't fork. Um, the reason being that you, you're bringing on a whole lot of work and that's part of what I'm going to be talking about is just the amount of work that's involved in keeping this thing up to date. Um, it also makes it tricky to push work upstream. It can lead to you not contributing stuff up, upstream that you probably should um, because you develop it internally and you tailor it so much to your internal stuff that it's hard to get up there. Um, so while we have a, a lot of rationale for doing that kind of stuff, that um, if I was starting up a new project, I would be working as hard as I can to try and make sure that I could self-contain my changes into things like uh, kernel objects, oh, sorry, kernel modules, or 
stuff that didn't involve actually forking. Um, but we're hoping to, yeah, sorry, I'm getting lost. Okay, so we have a fork. Um, and so as anyone who's maintained internal forks of software can attest, there's always fun incorporating changes from the upstream project. If all you've got is a few minor tweaks, it's not so hard. If all you're doing is changing tuning parameters, not so much of a problem, but we've got much more extensive changes and so hilarity tends to ensue. Um, our previous pattern for doing these version updates, so Isilon's 1FS started out being based on FreeBSD 5. Um, it got upgraded to, to FreeBSD 6, and so by that I mean it was a fork off the stable 5 branch. It then got, it then got sort of uplifted to being a fork off the stable 6 branch, and then up to the stable 7 branch. And it never really made it past that. Um, it's been sitting on being FreeBSD 7 based, but by FreeBSD 7 based, I mean FreeBSD 7 plus an array of backports uh, for quite a long time. And so this kind of gets me to the first lesson that I, I kind of want to drag out of this, this story that I'm telling here. Don't do that. <laughs> um, don't get behind. It can be really tempting to stay where you are. Once you've sort of brought yourself up to a certain point and you've chased all the bugs out, um, you've got more project, you know, feature projects you want to put uh, resources on, um, you know, it can be kind of nice to be there. I mean, one of our reasons was validation. You know, we, we sell a high value product uh, to big customers. Well, you know, that makes us an enterprise product. Um, it comes with a heightened level of expectation that your product's actually going to be solid. Um, and that means that you can have a bit of resistance to change, um, especially change to a large complex body of code that's not 100% yours. You don't have full control over it and it's in, it's integral part of our system but it's not fully under our control. Um, one of the ways to increase that was just to not change it. Um, so, and, and you know, that, that can lead to a certain level of comfort. Um, the problem being that you know, when you're in that nice little comfortable place, you're suddenly several major versions behind. You know, we're on stable seven. Um, you've hit the limits of what you can do with that codebase, which we have. We're starting to run into problems that can really only be solved by moving up to later versions. And you've also done things like pull in and adapt revisions that fix immediate needs without any thought to how you're gonna carry that forward. And you haven't marked where your changes are. And you've gotten slack with marking your local modifications and so it's really hard to differentiate between what's yours and what's something that's from upstream and at that point you're going to have a bad time. Um, the problem in this way of handling upgrades is it's kind of this big step approach. You're wearing a large amount of pain on a certain schedule. You, you, you start at stable five and then you have, to abs you have to abstract out what your change is and then move it up to stable six and then do that again to get up to stable seven. And because of the delays and, and not doing it, we're having to do, we were looking at having to do that from stable seven all the way up to stable 10. And that's not pleasant. Um, and so avoiding the change just leaves you with a pile of tech debt that just grows and grows and grows. So, Thus was born the, the Merge project. Um, so I joined Isilon's platforms team in February last year, 2013. Um, platforms in Isilon is the main group that cares about FreeBSD within the product um, and the various bits related to that. So we also look after ports and, and sort of all the other stuff around that. And so it fell to the platforms team to do something about the fact that we're on an outdated version of FreeBSD. Um, when I joined, we were partway through the first iteration of that project. Um, the, uh, the, the process in this one, um, it was sort of mildly ambitious. Um, we were gonna take FreeBSD current. Um, we were going to stick our file system and cluster backend and all the other sort of related code next to it. And then we were gonna make it build. Um, <laughs> So then that would basically be, you take the, free, the stock FreeBSD in our code and you bring in changes or adapt in changes from our source tree as needed to make it work. 
And this sounds really great because it means we're clearing out a pile of dead code. Because we're only porting over the bits that we need, um, we don't necessarily bring over all the dead stuff, like say our 32-bit user land stuff. Um, the problem is that the questions that are being raised around it were how do you know it will work? And more importantly to a bunch of people, when will it work? And the problem is that the answers to both of those are really fuzzy. Um, the when question is problematic because while you might be able to estimate the resolution time of each particular issue you come across, you can't know how many there are until you don't hit any more. And when you don't hit any more, does that mean there aren't any? Um, and that then leads into um, the how question and that kind of under, underscores the darker side of this, this sort of removal of unused and unneeded changes is that you can't be sure whether a change is actually unused or unneeded um, until you don't hit a problem with it. Um, it really comes down to this, uh, and that's when it really comes down to the scope and the coverage of your test suite. And while, you know, Isilon, we've got a pretty good test suite, but even we'd admit that it could be even bigger uh, and take even longer. Uh, some of our tests can run for hours, if not days. Um, so the problem is that our testing of FreeBSD itself um, has been more organic than systematic. We've generally gone, okay, we're hitting a bug in this, so write a test. Okay, the test is showing that the bug is there, and now we fix it, and the bug and the test now passes. Excellent. Or we're going to make a change here, so let's make a test to make sure that the change works. That's great, but it means that part of the nervousness within the organization around this merge project was how do we know that we're not going to break something subtle in FreeBSD and then have a really bad time? Um, so, and when, you're being, when your entire business revolves around making sure that people's data stays put and doesn't go away, you really want to be sure about this kind of stuff. Um, and so the amount of change that, was, um, that this project embodied was just bringing up all that kind of nervousness and, and, and paranoia. And so we really needed to have a, a think about how we addressed that. So at one point, um, one of the engineers had actually been involved in previous up, uh, update projects um, in the company, spoke up and put up an alternate plan. Uh, the new plan involved instead uh, taking our code tree, so the, the one that we had already, and then iterating through FreeBSD changes, adding them until we got to where we needed to, uh, using our internal test suites as validation. So there's, um, so yeah, this brings us to this one. The, the thing that this plan didn't do was kill off all those unused and unneeded changes. On the other hand, we knew that we, were, we had all the changes there so that we were more comfortable with that we weren't losing anything, but part of our problem was we didn't keep our local changes under control. Um, we've got really widespread changes, probably more than we actually need, and we've also been really bad at getting rid of the ones that we actually do not need anymore. So for example, uh, someone adds a bunch of diagnostic stuff to find a bug. Um, part of what we end up having to bring across is that diagnostic code that's still there even though the bug's been fixed. Um, so I know that Netflix, for example, are a lot more aggressive at keeping their diff small than we are. Um, they've got different usage parameters than we do and that makes it easier for them. They also uh, started doing this a bit later than we did, but still. Um, so one of the things that, we, that this doesn't do is, is cut those changes out. Um, the general point of view around this version was that we just bring everything up to head um, or at least somewhere that we were comfortable with and then go through the resulting diff and start actively looking for things that we could upstream, delete or deal with in other ways. Um, and the other thing is that you've probably noticed that I've been talking about uh, moving it up to head. This is a great idea. Um, it was part of the original plan as well. We went for a check out of current rather than a check out of stable 10 or stable 9 at the time. Um, and it came out of discussions about how to avoid getting behind again. Um, FreeBSD current over the years has actually become alarmingly stable. 
um, in a lot of cases. And various things have contributed to that. Some of them are good. We've got, um, I think, over the years, we've gotten better at sort of the, the pre-commit testing of, of things before we actually put them in the tree. And some are less good as that sort of less things are happening or less big things are happening. I mean, if you think back to when FreeBSD was at its most unstable in current, most people would probably think about FreeBSD 5. Um, that was when we were trying to go through and completely fine grain the, 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 the locking systems to allow us to do proper SMP. Um, and we haven't really had a body of work as disruptive and wide ranging in that in quite a while. Um, since then, it's actually gotten a lot more stable. So we figured if we combine that stability with our internal testing and release engineering, we reckon we could release off head and thus be able to just track head on an ongoing basis. And I think this, this is just huge for us. Um, it's a great idea and it's not just a great idea for us, it's a great thing for FreeBSD because now FreeBSD will be getting like belted through our, our internal test systems. And I think I actually got a message today from one of our guys that did the merge work that we'd actually found a, a use after free bug in the kernel in head through the testing that we're doing on our merge project. So, I mean, this is sort of like FreeBSD benefited for years for being the frontline server OS at Yahoo. I mean, that was a long time ago, but they, we got a lot of stability in, in that kind of serving class from being that. And what I'm hoping is that as Isilon moves ahead with this project, uh, we'll be able to contribute a similar sort of um, testing and, and proving environment for FreeBSD. So back to the story, we decided to go ahead with plan B. Uh, the first thing we had to do was to work out a way to bring in the FreeBSD changes to our source tree. Um, so, you know, obviously Git would be a perfect tool for this. Um, Git uh, allows you to merge from other branches, you know, you can rebase, you can do all that kind of stuff, but naturally like all modern forward thinking organisations, we use Subversion. Um, so Subversion, it's a thing. Um, it can merge branches within a repository and it can track the, the merges that it's done and so that's cool. Uh, it can't do that across repositories. Um, I don't know why uh, the merge info format looks like it should be able to do that, but it, it doesn't. Um, so we wrote a script. Um, we stole Subversion's own merge info format and we just stuck a different version of it in another property and used that to track revisions that we pulled in from FreeBSD. And then we did some, uh, some archaeology to work out what FreeBSD revision we could, we could reliably say we'd merged up to and then we bootstrapped the merge info with that. And then we wrote a Python script using PySVN that would pull in revisions from FreeBSD head and apply them into our repository until it hit a conflict. Um, and we also did some other tooling as well. I, I'm, my, I've got previous history in writing web applications and so we wrote a, a thing for tracking it which management loved. Um, so the green ones are ones that we'd merged, the, the white ones we hadn't yet. It would mark ones as skipped and the bit that management loved the most was over on the left there where it showed, it showed them how fast we were working. Because this was part of, part of the, the, the win out of this was just being able to get a better idea on how long it would take once we'd actually done some of the work. Um, so we started work and immediately ran into um, <laughs> So like I said, we were on stable seven and we were on stable seven plus a whole bunch of mismatched and adapted backports. Um, and we're trying to get onto head. Now, now Git has a term for this, it's called a rebase. This was the ugliest rebase you ever, ever thought of. Um, we had, you know, our, our branch off stable seven, you try and pull in a revision from head and half the time you would either have a variant patch, so a change had gone into head and then had been adapted to merge back into stable seven and so then we had to untangle that or the most fun was because we would have pulled in a back port, we would be pulling in a change that moved a, a particular piece of code from version A to version B but we already had version C um, and so we'd have to look at that and go, oh so hang on, we actually need to ignore that change because this is going to change 
further down the line. And some, in some cases, we had version F. And so you'd keep hitting this conflict on this bit of code over and over again. That's lots of fun. Um, so, and that slowed things down quite a bit in the early phases of this. Um, however, we, one of the things that we could do with this is run it through our existing test suite. Um, this was great because we could actually prove that we weren't breaking things. Um, so, and after a while using the tools that I showed you, the tool I showed you before, we could establish a rate at which we were applying revisions and extrapolate an end date from there. There were only two problems. Um, one is that there were changes to the way layer two addresses and routing were handled and they totally blew up our cluster backend. Um, we, we, we have an InfiniBand stack that predates the one that went into the FreeBSD tree and it made a whole bunch of assumptions as to how things worked and then the L2 changes came along and it blew up. Um, and that stopped us from using the test automation because the test automation relies on being able to construct clusters. And when you don't have a back-end network, you can't build a cluster. Um, and instead of stopping it and fix, stopping and fixing everything there, we kept going. So we were, we were still pulling in changes and that meant that we had a whole pile of changes that weren't tested. And then after the couple of months that it took to fix the InfiniBand stack, um, we ha then had to go through and fix everything. Um, that wasn't the main thing that sank it. The, the main thing that sank it was um, it wasn't very fast. The merge process, as you can kind of work out, was very single threaded. Only one person could be doing it at a time because you needed to make sure that people weren't trying to pull in the same revision. Um, we got around that slightly due to the fact that I live in Australia and so I would take one shift and the other, the other engineer was working on this uh, was based in California and he would take another shift. And because our time zones didn't really overlap all that much, we could kind of be working for say 12 to 16 hours out of a day rather than just eight. Um, but it's still just, even after we got out of the, the stable seven era of having to deal with this version A to version B to version C stuff, um, we still weren't merging fast enough to really hit where we needed to go. So we had to go back to the drawing board again. Um, this second approach was not a total loss though. We'd made enough progress that we'd mostly leveled out the something, well, we'd leveled out a lot of the mess of backported revisions that we'd had. Um, enough that we could do a diff between the revision we'd merged up to and the stock FreeBSD tree at that revision. Um, so the last approach was um, take the diff we generated between FreeBSD and, the, and our code base and split it out in roughly by logical pieces. Um, and then we took a check out of our source tree, stripped out every uh, FreeBSD sourced file in it, uh, replaced it with the version we wanted to get to, and then started applying these changes to FreeBSD so that we had a baseline that was a modified version of FreeBSD. And then we put our code in next to it and then we make it all work. Um, so again, I, I wrote another web app, which I can't show you this one because it's got internal code in it. Um, but that was more about tracking who was owning a particular bit of the diff, whether it was merged, whether it had, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so this might sound quite familiar to the first iteration that we went through of the take a clean FreeBSD checkout and just make it work. The difference is that instead of just pulling in changes as needed, we're pulling all of the changes in up front and then making everything work, which gets us around the nervousness around missing changes that we don't need. Um, once we're done, then we'll take what we were going to do and, and sort of rigorously audit the changes we've got and start trying to strip things out. Um, and we're also getting way, way more serious about testing things. Um, and particularly around testing the FreeBSD elements of our system specifically. Um, so one of our employees is Peter Holm. Uh, Peter Holm wrote the Stress 2 uh, test suite and he's, been, he's doing that for us. He's contributing a whole bunch of stuff back to FreeBSD as well. 
Um, this is going to be a theme contributing back to FreeBSD. Um, so we're using that on our stuff. We've also, he's also written some internal stress tests for us. Um, we're getting really serious about ATF and Cure. Um, we're running, we're running, we pulled in the ATF and Cure stuff. We also pulled in a lot of the work that Garrett Cooper has been doing in porting tests over from NetBSD. We're also getting people to write us new tests and we're hoping to be able to contribute a whole lot of those back up to FreeBSD. Um, and which is awesome. Um, and we're also ensuring that as much of our internal validation we, uh, we can run against every build that we've got, even if that means we have to stub things out early on, once they start to pass, then we can leave them turned on and it's great. And it's paying off. We're finding bugs a lot faster. Um, like I said, we found one in head earlier, um, and which is great for us because we know that we're not busting things. Um, and it's also great in, in placating the same sort of people who get nervous about the fact that we're changing all this. Um, so that leads to another lesson for me, which is back when things stopped and sort of decisions were sort of, I, I, I'm guessing, I wasn't around for it, but it was my feeling that the, it's not so much a decision that gets made, it's more of a, just a step that's not taken. When you get, when you fall behind in this kind of thing, it's usually that you go, oh, well, we don't need to move up. And you don't actually stop to think about why it is you're not doing that. Um, if validation is the reason that you don't want to upgrade, if you're worried about it, then fix the validation. Don't just decide that it's safe and comfortable where you are because then you're just racking up the tech debt. So solve the problems that actually stop you keeping current as opposed to just deciding that it's okay to not do it. That's more of a 2020 hindsight thing than something that's obvious at the time, but that's how it goes. So. The project is still in train. I can't tell you that it's been a smashing success. It's going well, but it hasn't finished yet. So I'm very much looking that we took forward to us shipping it. I think we're going to make it. I think we're doing good. Um, but what happens after that? Um, this is the other reason why it's a good idea to track head and not a stable branch, because head's always going to be alive. Um, the problem if you're tracking a stable branch is if you do stay on that stable branch, eventually that stable branch will stop getting actively developed. It'll get mothballed and then you're not getting updates. Um, with the tools that we developed for our revision-based approach, the, the plan B, um, where, and the tests that we're adding in, we're planning to be able to pull in a whole bunch of head at the start of each release cycle internally, put it into our head branch, and then we, that gets then tested and proved out during the development cycle, which means that we can actually stay a lot closer to the top of current than we do now. Um, and that also means that we don't have to do these huge uplift projects from stable X to stable Y. Um, and it also means that we're in a much better position to do things in FreeBSD directly, because suddenly the payoff for having developed something for FreeBSD is a lot faster. Um, historically, we'd have to wait until it hit the stable branch that we wanted to use. And so the timeline before making, contributing a feature to FreeBSD and us being able to use it was just too long. Now, if we're tracking ahead, we can do things like um, work on, you know, add features to FreeBSD in various ways and then pull them back into our product and use them there. Um, so the final lesson is really support the community. Um, if you're going to put a community-based project at the core of your product, supporting that community, whether you like it or not, is now a really high priority for you. Because if you don't support it, you run the risk of the community going away and suddenly you own, in the sense of being 100% responsible for, a lot more code than you used to. Um, in our case, FreeBSD is a big thing for our product and we're working on getting a lot better at making sure that we give back. Um, so this will be taking the form of developing things in FreeBSD directly, doing a lot more testing. I'm also looking into how we can contribute to making FreeBSD itself more tested. Um, the Cure and ATF stuff that, that Julio Marino is doing is great. Um, the Jenkins stuff that Craig Rodriguez is doing is great. What I'd love to see and what I'm hoping to get them to work towards is having Jenkins building a virtual machine image that then gets booted and Cure gets run on it. If we could have Cure being run on a live instance of FreeBSD several times a day, that's brilliant. 
Um, and yeah, we're also, and so we're, that's why we're contributing to the testing stuff. And if we can contribute more tests than that, then that's just getting FreeBSD more tested. It makes FreeBSD current more, um, more uh, stable for us. It makes it, and it makes it a lot easier to just keep pulling changes in from FreeBSD because we know that it's going to be, be there for us. Um, so basically, in conclusion, don't get behind. You'll really regret it. <laughs> we, we are regretting it. Um, if you are tempted to drop behind, try and work out why that is. Uh, keep your local changes under control. Um, minimize your diff as much as you can. That can mean upstreaming. That can mean deleting things. That can mean adapting things to try and use other parts that require less change on your part. Where you do change things, mark them. We have part of what we're doing is going through and just making sure that all our changes are marked. You can use comments, you can use if defs, all that kind of stuff, but just make sure you know what your changes are. Having documentation on what your changes are and the intent behind them would be great, but you know, let's be realistic here. Um, if you can, track head. Some people don't feel comfortable doing that. I would recommend it. I think it's the best way forward because you're in a much better position to contribute. You're, um, you don't have to have these uplift projects, so on and so forth. Solve the problems that stop you keeping current. Like, like I said in, in the first one, if, if you feel tempted to not upgrade, try and work out why that is. And make sure that you're giving back because otherwise the community might not be there anymore. Um, and that, while short, is what I have. Thank you. Questions? As you're uh, well aware, um, within across businesses, especially in Australia, um, they have a tendency of like being risk averse. They don't like doing updates, or if they do, they've got like an 18 month cycle before they actually get the update. Mm -hmm. Well, I, sorry, the question was, um, given that we're an enterprise business, our customers, how are we going to make sure that our customers are applying updates? Um, so our, our current plan for a release cycle is at the start of the release cycle, we'll drop in as much change from head as we, we feel comfortable um, to get as much of the new stuff in. Our release cycles tend to be in the order of, well, over a year. And so, and when when the uh, when the upgrades go out, we're not they'll have that change in them. Obviously, if if we hit bugs that we need to pull in revisions from head to fix, they'll get rolled into those bugs and sent out. But our, the release cycle of of one FS is kind of detached significantly from the release cycle of FreeBSD. So. <coughs> Yeah. Yeah, and because we need to be able to st stabilize and prove out what we have. And so that means <clears throat> at some point we do have to stop taking changes. So release X will have changes up to revision A, release Y will have changes up to revision B, and so on and so forth. And there may be some cherry picked revisions from further ahead of that that we just need to fix, fix bugs and whatnot. Any other questions? So the question was, how do we decide what uh, head revision we're targeting? Um, with the one we've got now, uh, the thought process was we want stable 10, well, we want something close to the 10 release, but with, so we don't want the stable 10 branch point. We want post the stable 10 branch point, so we want the fixes that had to go in to get uh, re the 10 release stable. But we also wanted a couple of features that came in there, which was mainly the, the revised locking around CAM and the direct dispatch stuff for GEOM. And so the revision was picked based on, based on that. Um, 
future releases will probably be sitting down and saying, right, so if we work our way back from where Head is right now, is that a safe place to do it or should we take it further back or are we waiting for something to come in or so on and so forth. I think it's going it's to be a discussion each time, but it's going to be a discussion that we have sort of once a year or, or thereabouts. Um, any other questions? Yes? Um, you made the point that current is pretty stable these days. It's yeah. obviously still less stable than stable branding current specifically. Yes. Um, did you have any trouble kind of convincing QA people or managers that it's worth the trade off to pick something that's slightly less stable? Uh, so the question was uh, so current is going to be less stable than stable, so how do we convince management? Um, thankfully, a lot of our management were quite happy to go with the plan. Um, especially when, uh, because one of the things was, you know, how did we get so far behind and how do we stop it happening again? And so one of the, the answers to how do we stop it happening again was, um, well, let's stop sticking to stable branches. Because then you just have this, like I said, these big uplift projects to get from stable X to stable Y. And so if we can stop having to do that, the question then becomes how do we then validate what we've got and that's where all this extra testing infrastructure and stuff is coming in and just making sure that we can actually prove that what we've got is stable and does work. And so that means just, yeah, test all the things, basically. Anyone? No? Thank you very much.